Hi and welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life, with me, your host, Aaron Halevi. In today's show, Rabbi Avram Trugman continues his series on the Shema. We visit the Ari Synagogue in Tzfat, and Rabbi Daniel Khan elaborates on how to develop one's approach to prayer. The Shema represents much more than the cardinal statement of Jewish faith in one God. The prayer also encapsulates Judaism's mission in the world, from the time of Abraham until this very day. Rabbi Avram Trugman continues with his series on the Shema, explaining how to take the time to contemplate the depth of philosophical and spiritual wisdom encoded within the words of the Shema. One of the most important lessons in life is when things aren't going our way, not to throw up our hands and give up and think, where is God? God is not here, God doesn't hear, God doesn't care. When we say that God is one, it means whatever we're going through, whatever the world is going through. Again, I would be the first one to admit that many times we simply do not understand God's ways. We don't understand how God's oneness is manifest in a world of duality, of good and evil, and all that that entails. But the idea of nothing being as whole as a broken heart, one of the meanings of the four-letter name of God that is mentioned in the Shema is that, that this is God's quality of compassion, of mercy, and of love. And we're told that God created the world because he wanted to give. He wanted a relationship. He wanted to love, and he wanted to be loved. Of course, this is a, a, a very wide philosophical discussion that we cannot delve into right now. But this idea that one of the essential qualities of God is compassion and love and caring, for, we'll call it for better or for worse, we usually don't learn those lessons until our hearts have been broken. Not just in love through sickness or tragedy or concern with the uh, state of the world, when we feel deeply the pain of the world, of another person, our own pain, and on a deep level, God's pain at what mankind has done with the free will that he gave us. See, God, most of the time, has to play by the rules that he makes. And once he gave mankind free choice, it has to be for real, so he has to allow mankind to rise or fall on its choices. Sometimes God does intervene when we're about to go over the cliff as individuals or a community or a nation or the world. But again, for better or for worse, we learn such, such important lessons through feeling other people's pain. So that's what it means. There's nothing as whole as a broken heart. In a sense, I'd like to give a bracha that we never have to experience getting there with a broken heart. But it seems that that's how God has made his world. And so we shouldn't be afraid of feeling other people's pain. A lot of people want to close themselves, because they're, not because they don't want to feel other people's pain, but they're afraid of, of the emotions that feeling other people's pains will bring up in themselves. And there are, people are afraid of unpleasant feelings, but we, but we shouldn't be. When something tragic happens, we should feel that pain, not to be incapacitated by it, not to give up faith be because of it, not, sh and not shutting down because of it, emotionally or spiritually. But to feel pain actually le leads us to a great wholeness. It is a long-standing tradition in Judaism 
that if a person is aware that they're about to pass away, that they recite the Shema. There are many, many stories told of literally millions of people in the Holocaust that went to their deaths saying the Shema. So it's not a theoretic idea. It applies to the individual, but we, we saw in mass during the Holocaust. But also connected to this very interesting is when we go to sleep at night, we also say the Shema because who knows if they're going to wake up? We assume so, but we don't know so. So we say the Shema before we go to sleep because maybe it's our souls will leave us. And that is what helps us transition from this world to the world to come, from being awake to sleep. And it shows our total faith that in this world, the next world, God is one. In order for prayer to be meaningful and provide spiritual fulfillment, Rabbi Daniel Kahn believes that one should understand what many rabbis call the work of the heart. Rabbi Kahn teaches us how one can develop one's own personal approach to God and prayer in both an intellectual as well as an emotional and spiritual way. Another beautiful thing that the uh, Torah tells us about man is that he's created in the divine image, which for all the interpretations of what that's about, the most basic thing is that you can be home with God. You can feel at home with God because if you're in his image, that means you have a very profound and intimate connection with him. So what, what prayer actually becomes is the personal expression of what divine will is coming through us, which we then express back to him. So let me say this more simply. So um, when a person has a hope and a yearning, so it's not yet prayer. That's hope and yearning. But the awareness that I'm part of this creation and that the soul of this creation, which we call God, is aware and awake and looking to hear what it is the creation desires to move forward with so that he and creation can be in partnership and together. So when we express that will to the divine, to God, so then his response is to move things in that direction. Because in a very real way, what he's looking for and waiting for is to be together with us in a joint project. This is, this is um, a deep aspect of Torah, which is, which is really less a book of law. It's full of stories and people and things happening. I mean, to call it a book of law is really to miss a lot of what's happening inside. What's really happening inside is a story of a relationship, and it's defined as Sefer Habrit, which really means the book of relationship. So when you realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're actually talking about a relationship. We're talking about a connection that leaves man not alone, but actually the, the, the main part that connects back to the origin of, of, of the universe, to the origin of creation, and partners with that origin, partners with that original will, partners with that original power and consciousness, which is God. So then the Torah becomes the book of this relationship and our expression to God of what it is that we're yearning for and hoping for becomes our joining together with him in a joint project. So one of the really important things to understand about prayer is that it um, doesn't just take place in the normal state of mind or the normal emotional condition or the normal stance of, you know, 
me talking to you or talking to someone else or in a regular kind of a rattly kind of conversation. And unfortunately, a lot of people actually who have a practice of prayer, unfortunately, pray that way. They kind of rattle it off rather than um, preparing. Now, pre preparation, I would say, is the key to the answer to the question. Preparation. Because um, what, what is required is to move yourself into a particular kind of a state in which, one, there's an expanded sense of self. Meaning, it's not just little old me sitting here. I'm part of a very big and broad world and experience of that. So that requires something which might be akin to a uh, simple sitting in silence, experiencing makom, which is place. To simply experience place. Uh, to let that expand, not just from into local space or place, into a broader and broader experience of, I'm here together with all of this. I'm not alone. I'm part of a very big reality. Now, one can do that through simple silence. One can do that through melody. One can do that from reading some inspired writings from the Torah. One can do that also in a conscious conversation which is intended to move towards that. And one can also do that taking a walk in nature. One can do it coming to synagogue as long as you spend time coming to synagogue and don't just rush there, listen to the news on the way in the car, get out, walk in, and get, get to the liturgy. But rather, the rabbis have a teaching that a person gets a reward for his footsteps towards the synagogue. It's called schar psiot. So lots of people think that means, well, okay, I guess the longer I walk, the more reward I get. That's not what it's about. What it's about is that when you walk outside and open yourself up, experience the dynamic, experience the vitality of your body, reflect upon that as being part of the vitality of this world, and then come in to, might be a formal practice of prayer, the siddur, the, the synagogue, or the, whatever it'll be. So then one comes in already with an expanded sense of myself as being part of this whole big creation. So that's the first, first step, is, um, is expanding one's awareness. One of the ways the rabbis describe that is um, in one other step that's taken, and that is understanding that this creation has a, a, a personhood behind it, which is the divine, which is God. So then one moves into what the rabbis call seeing oneself as standing before the Shekhinah. Shekhinah, which means the Divine Presence, the capital P, Presence that's fully present here. So if I've had a practice now of experiencing my presence here, then I can almost effortlessly move into ah, my presence here, presence here, the Divine Presence here. So when I move into that modality, now is when I can begin to speak to God, to talk to Him, um, and to be more profoundly uh, connected rather than obviously standing outside with some kind of a uh, rote interaction. Now, there are different methods. One, you know, I, I, I listed a few silence, a song just taking a walk outside consciously with that orientation. Um, all of these are meant, the rabbis say, to lead to a certain kind of a joy. And they um, say in the Talmud that a person actually cannot pray unless they have simcha, unless they have joy. Now, what the rabbis mean by simcha is not that the guy's dancing around and you know being really exuberant, but rather simcha is a very, um, very inward state. It can also have those expressions. I'm not against them at all, but but as an inward state, it's a very alive connection with existence, with life, just being there. Yeah. So when that happens, then one's heart gets opened. One's heart opens 
and then uh, prayers begin to flow. Welcome back. While walking along the cobbled streets and blue painted houses of the old city of Tzfat, one will find the Ashkenazi Ha'ari Synagogue. Named after Kabbalist and Torah scholar Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Luria, the synagogue is one of the oldest still in use, dating back to the late 16th century. It was built in the site where the Ari and his disciples sang the Kabbalat Shabbat service to welcome the Sabbath. Ari, a Hebrew acronym for the words Our Master Rabbi Yitzchak, is also the Hebrew word for lion. The Ari passed away at the age of just 38, yet he is known as one of the great Kabbalists of Tzfat. This is quite remarkable, considering that he had only come to Tzfat two years before this. It is told that when his father was studying one day, he received a revelation from Elijah the prophet that he would have a son who would be a great sage and would help transform his people from sin. The prophet also told the Ari's father that his son would reveal many of the mysteries of the Kabbalistic book called the Zohar. The Ari was born in Jerusalem in 1534. He lost his father and, at an early age, was brought up by his rich maternal uncle, who placed him under the wing of the best teachers. Although he married a cousin at the age of 15, he soon became a recluse and would retreat into a cottage where he would meditate and study the Zohar. The Ari said little and would only visit his family on Shabbat. On Shabbat, he would dress in a garment of all white. After moving to Tzfat, the Ari joined a circle of great Kabbalists led by Moshe Cordovero. After Cordovero passed away, the community looked to the Ari for his mystical guidance. Many had fled Spain after the expulsion of the Jews and, after moving to the Holy Land, believed they were in the time of challenge before the coming of the Messiah and found comfort in the Ari's teachings. Ari Circle soon became a separate community. While he taught spontaneously without writing down his teachings, many were recorded by a disciple, Rabbi Chaim Vital. By 1650, the Ari's ideas were known throughout Europe. The synagogue was built 500 years ago in the beginning of the 16th century by a, co a congregation of uh, Sephardic Jews from Greece. It was named after the Holy Ari, the truth, much later. Only when it was rebuilt after the destruction of the synagogue in the year 1837, January 1st, on the Jewish calendar of Dalit Tevet, in this terrible earthquake which destroyed Sfat completely and caused, unfortunately, 2,000 casualties. In fact, 2,000, almost 2,000 people lost their lives here. And unfortunately, most of them were Jews at the time because the demographic situation here in the 19th century was that, that there was a majority of Jews living in the old city of Tzfat and the minority of Arabs. It took 20 years to rebuild the synagogue, which was only in the year 1857, standing again on its feet, just the way we see it now. But the original uh, structure of the synagogue was um, kept. Uh, although being built originally, established by a Sephardic congregation, nowadays it serves literally everyone, it's still called the Ashkenazi Ari Synagogue, Ashkenazi, because of the style of the prayer and um, eventually um, the standard for the tefillah, for the cantor, was added here so that the tefillah can be led from here rather than traditionally Safari Jews that run the tefillah all through from the bima, from the higher part of the synagogue, as all the congregation actually sing the tefillah together. Another thing to, we can notice here, which is very special, is the ark. The ark, which took four years for a carpenter who came specially from Europe after the destruction of the synagogue and carved it and made it so beautifully shaped from one piece of olive tree, which he chopped in the forest out of Tzfat. Four years with a small knife, little by little, he made this beautiful ark. Um, 
something you know special about this synagogue. I mean, we can speak almost in every corner. We can find something important to say. <laughs> uh, this synagogue is really very special. Uh, it looks like a museum, but it's not. It's a very active synagogue with three prayers a day, midday, uh, morning, of course, and the, the evening prayer. Um, the direction of the prayer in this synagogue, like all other synagogues in Tzfat, is to the south, the direction of Yerushalayim, which is actually this direction. Um, in this synagogue, you see like some kind of, you know, items that you don't find anywhere else. They, even if you look at this wall over here, you see the ten sefirot, you know, the most famous Kabbalistic symbol uh, of the, you know, um, tree of life, the sefirot. Um, behind me also on the wall, you can see a drawing of the western wall and of the tomb of Rachel, uh, symbolizing the yearning of Jews to access those pl places for spiritual worship, uh, tefillah, prayer. Um, as you see in this synagogue, we see the color blue, like in other synagogues of Tzvat, interior, exterior, railings, tombs of the sages, all have a lot of the blue. What's the reason? The color blue in Judaism, and generally speaking, it's the color of the sky, obviously. But in Tzvat, it's of more importance and significance because, as we know, Tzvat is the city of the Kabbalah. One of the meanings to the word Kabbalah, as the Kabbalists themselves explain, is it is that it is associated with the Hebrew word Hakbalah, which means parallels. As we know, Kabbalah teaches the parallels, the symmetry, the correspondence between physical and spiritual. The idea of bringing heaven down to earth is therefore here more real, more solidly real, as we can see the color blue wherever we go. It's the parallels, it's the symmetry, the correspondence between what's below and what's above. As we say, as below, so above. We can make it happen. It's all up to us. What we do here, what we arouse from below, is what eventually comes from above to us and to all of the universe. This is a primary uh, concept of the Kabbalah, the parallels, the symmetry. The Ari, Rabbi Isaac Luri of blessed memory, is the one that emphasizes more than perhaps any other sage of the Kabbalah before, telling how each person can be so influential with his good deeds over everything that's happening throughout the entire creation, the entire universe. It's a one good deed down here that is so, so important to the wellness and well-being of every individual and every part and element of the entire world. The Ari is buried in the cemetery in Svat, and many pilgrims make their way to his grave throughout the year and also immerse in the famous Ari Mikveh, or ritual bath, which is adjacent to the cemetery. Well, that's all we have for this week's episode of Simcha, a celebration of life. As always, we'd love to hear from you, so please send us a message on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions. From me, Aaron Halevi, and the rest of the Simcha team, have a wonderful week ahead. Shavuot Tov. <laughs>